to me, that's where the, the balance between art and craft mm -hmm. lies. The craft is in the construction, the fabrication. Mm -hmm. The art is in the design, the planning, mm -hmm. and bringing the two together at the right point. Well, welcome back to Gage Hill Crafts, everyone. I'm Sarah Scully, and today I'm here with Phil Gonschwager. <laughs> Did I say that right? That's good. <laughs> okay. Um, of Atlantic Art Glass and Design uh, in Randolph. And um, Phil was introduced to me by a mutual friend. Uh, he is a glass artist and metal worker. Is that how you'd characterize yourself? <laughs> I would never have brought myself into the realm of metalworking. Okay. I have never done metalworking before this. Mm -hmm. um, my own background is as a graphic designer and a commercial artist. Oh, okay. Interesting. Yeah, I started out as a package designer for mm -hmm. Procter & Gamble back in the uh, early 70s. And uh, my original background is in graphic design mm -hmm. before the internet. Mm -hmm. And when graphic design made the switch to the internet, I didn't go with it. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. But I can see, I can definitely see the influence now in your work. And we'll show some uh, examples of Phil's work throughout the interview. Um, yeah, I can tell that you have that graphic sensibility it's, for sure it's very strong in your work and and drafting drafting mm -hmm. and architectural design which mm -hmm. is an, obviously a big part of what I've done over the years also right um, and so how did you get started then transitioning into uh, glass work um, from graphic design it was a hobby at first I assume and I would more say familiar. it was more of an interest. Mm -hmm. I didn't actually pursue it as a hobby, other than um, it was a, something that had a family background because I had a great uncle who um, restored stained glass windows in Cleveland most of his life. Okay. And so I always had an interest in it, and then when I had an opportunity while I was traveling out west in Oregon, I took a very basic beginner's class in stained glass at a craft center in mm -hmm. Eugene. And that first year I made a window. And the next year I made one more, mm -hmm. of which it's still hanging over there. It's the second one I ever made over there. Okay. And, and then I just continued with the interest. Mm -hmm. um, when I moved to Vermont, I met a couple of uh, antiques dealers here, and uh, they were curious as to whether or not I could fix broken windows. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't know, so I said, bring me some broken windows, and we'll see. <laughs> and so I taught myself how to do restoration. Okay. And that kind of moved me into um, a group in Montpelier in the 1980s who formed an architectural salvage company and they were buying a lot of stained glass windows and i went to work for them in 1979 and set up a glass studio and started really repairing stained glass okay by the mm -hmm. hundreds which was like a tremendous education so you take the windows apart right. then you learn how to put together and yep. um with my graphic design background it just naturally translated into the glasswork I was doing. Mm -hmm. It's both design, it's all about line, it's all about color, it's all about building. And um, I kind of progressed from there. Then I got really interested in it and went to um, Pilchuck Glass School out in Stanwood, Washington. Okay, so from your um, restoration work, uh, it seems like that really kind of helped inform your graphic work. Um, and before we sat down together, Phil was showing me some windows that he's sort of, I want to say upcycled almost. It's, it's you know, taking a window that was mostly finished or mostly one thing and then adding another piece or changing the, the central theme or taking right. a part of a door that, that, you know, you were going to reuse, but then you have this leftover piece to do something else with. So tell us a little bit about your, uh, I guess, choices and aesthetics for those kinds of projects. Well, that... that started with the restoration business because mm -hmm. we would buy windows that were so totally in disrepair as they were 
not possible to be restored. Mm -hmm. So rather than toss them out, um, I decided to turn them into other things. So in other words, if I had a bunch of background glass that was non-replaceable, but the, the other elements in the window were still usable, I would just take all the background glass out and replace it with either clear window glass or some other color. Mm -hmm. And then subsequently at one point, I learned that my great uncle who passed away 50 years ago had left his studio pretty much intact in the basement oh. of this house in Cleveland. Wow. And his <laughs> daughter gave me all of this old glass. Mm -hmm. um, what he had done being a true frugal German was every piece of colored painted glass that he ever took out of a church, he saved it mm -hmm. in boxes. And um, I decided that all these little scraps were just being, um, they would never get used if I didn't do something with them. Mm -hmm. So I conceived of a glass gazebo that I wanted to build in my backyard. Okay. And at the same time, I was teaching basic stained glass classes here mm. in Randolph for the White River Craft Center. Mm -hmm. I did that for 16 years. And um, we kind of referred to it as continuing education. I basically taught the same class that I had learned my mm -hmm. class in uh, Oregon. Mm -hmm. And in the process of teaching that class, I would take all those little scraps of glass and I would make a sample panel with them as I was teaching the class. Mm -hmm. And over the course of all those years, I made 50 of these windows, which I have in a rack over there, <laughs> <laughs> and are uh, ready to build this glass gazebo uh -huh. with these 50 panels. But I pretty much utilized all of those broken scraps of window. And uh, I'll have to show you a little later, but um, they would never have been put back into circulation. Right. It is, you could call it upgrading. I mean, right. Yeah, it's or, very interesting. Or just reusing. I know a lot reusing. of people who do that with their craft. I mean, that's where quilting comes in, is using your old bed sheets that have holes in them and you cut them up and make a new blanket. Or even people who go to thrift stores and take sweaters and unravel them and then make knit something else out of that yarn because the material's still yeah. good, but the sweater had a hole in it or something. Well, with me also, so, yeah. another aspect of my own artwork is mm -hmm. assemblage. Right. And that a lot of that, I've been doing that since I was a kid. Mm -hmm. um, I'm obviously a junk collector. <laughs> and, um, and I put these things together into uh, assemblage sculptures. So it's the same kind of concept translated into glass mm -hmm. where you're just kind of reusing pieces that are already done mm -hmm. in a more abstract but designed way. And, right. um, I find it really interesting. I was going to say it has its own creative challenges, right? Because you have the set amount of stuff to work with and you have to figure out how to best you do. Essentially, artistically put it together. You yeah. take two or three of these pieces, which may not be unrelated other than color, mm -hmm. and then you place them onto a format and basically fill in the background mm -hmm. and then come up with it. I find it very kind of a freeing design, you know, mode that mm -hmm. um, you don't get in the very... Um, defined parameters of advertising and architecture and building and where everything is designed from the beginning and then translated into a finished product at the mm -hmm. end. Mm -hmm. um, this is a little more kind of making up as you go along. Right. So I, it's a really interesting way to do it. I, I had a lot of fun with it. Mm -hmm. That's cool. Um, so speaking of designing from the beginning, you uh, do... Uh, a good deal of commission work, I see, and we'll talk about your big current project in just a second. Um, but how how has that, um, I guess, career channel uh, evolved? Is it just a natural evolution out of your restoration work and, and those clients coming back and saying, oh, yeah, I like the door you fixed for me. Now can you make a window to match or something like that? Or is it... Sometimes. I mean, I, this is a very odd business. I've been... You might call it a business. I always called it freelancing. Mm -hmm. I mean, in the course of my entire career, I probably only worked for somebody else for about 10 years. Mm -hmm. So a lot of it is repeat business. A lot of it is, you know, word travels. You need something done. 
This sure. is what this fellow does. Um, the larger projects I actually kind of fell into when I, um, I don't know, probably about 16, 18 years ago, I, my first public art commission was a mm -hmm. competition in Burlington. Mm -hmm. And um, I found that that was a way to bring work into the studio mm -hmm. for a greater period of time than other just kind of project that would take you three days and you're done and then you go look for the next job. Right. So um, I've kind of made a partial career out of pursuing public art projects mm -hmm. for the last 18 years. Okay. Mm -hmm. In particular, this project that I'm working on now in Waterbury because it came with a set of parameters that were very uh, limiting and taxing. Mm -hmm. In that uh, I've got probably a thousand pound sculpture that's going to hang off a railroad bridge mm -hmm. and I'm not allowed to bolt, screw, weld, <laughs> <laughs> or otherwise punch a hole into this bridge. Right, because it is a working uh, trestle. It's a working trestle. So yeah. it came with this all, a very limiting set of of parameters uh -huh. and yeah I was able to go into my background and go okay I know how to deal with this mm -hmm. we, can, we can solve this problem there is a way right and um, that's amazing so let's talk a little bit about the uh, I've been hinting around at it so let's talk about the the project so this is in Waterbury Vermont um, and it's right over uh, a main road it's the main street going into Waterbury downtown right um, there's a there's a trestle overpass and so this is going to be mounted onto the side of that. So how did you get this gig? Was this a this competition? This is a competition. Mm -hmm. This is a public art competition that was warned on the internet through the Vermont Arts Council. Mm -hmm. um, it's a collaboration with the uh, Vermont Arts Council and the Revitalizing Waterbury Committee who oh, have nice. been bringing Waterbury back since mm -hmm. the flood. Mm -hmm. um, the Arts Council has a new program in the state called Animating Infrastructure. And <laughs> that is essentially what this is. It's, right. it's a railroad bridge. It's over Main Street. It is considered infrastructure. And it was designated as a place to put Waterbury's first public art project. Mm -hmm. And so they called it the Rail Art mm -hmm. Sculpture Project. And they, so the, I, it's exciting that there's a lot of town participation. Mm -hmm. They had their own set of parameters. They wanted to deal with the history of the town, which is heavily into railroads. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I came up with my concept on, on just almost immediately on the first site visit. Right. And I saw the bridge. I'm familiar with the town. Um, my background is also heavily into architecture, building, mm -hmm. and uh, architectural drawing. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, you know, let's just, we'll put a train up there, and we'll use the buildings from Waterbury, historical buildings, as the train cars. Right. And um, okay. So let's talk a little bit more about, um, this is really coming along nicely. Phil's got uh, pieces of this all over his studio right now, and, and a lot of the main pieces look pretty close to complete, uh, to my untrained eye. Um, so what was your process once they said, you know, yes, we'd like to work with you, or the town voted and said, yes, we've, we've chosen you. Um, you had mock-ups at that point, and then- In my final presentation, drawings. I made a scale model, uh -huh. um, a conceptual model, mm -hmm. and it was designed to be, um, to the scale of the bridge. So mm -hmm. I made a drawing first. Uh, I went through a whole series of preliminary sketches of dozens of buildings, tried to narrow it down mm -hmm. to bring the scale into, we, we had a, a set budget, so mm -hmm. I had to be aware of um, estimating, mm -hmm. which is almost impossible, <laughs> especially something that large, you just right. don't know. Um, and so when I made my final presentation, I had a paper model of mm -hmm. the, the first two cars and, and the entire train that I was able to use for my presentation. Mm -hmm. And then once I got accepted to do the project, um, we went through another round of fussing with the design. So um, <laughs> then I started into the process, um, actually 
New Year's Day, of taking the scale model, which luckily they were already scale drawings, mm -hmm. um, after I had photographed the town and then translated the photographs into the drawings, trying to bring the uh, architecture elements that were important to the specific buildings. Mm -hmm. Then I started to translate them into full-size working drawings mm -hmm. by utilizing uh, an overhead projector, projecting the scale drawings onto a graph paper so mm -hmm. that I could straighten the lines out, balance everything, make, yep. make it work. Um, that ended up, I probably spent the better part of three months mm -hmm. in the planning and design and getting every all the details completely worked out. Mm -hmm. And um, so you have to be aware of the business sense of it. Right. I had a pretty good idea that we had a budget that we could work with. We weren't going to make a lot of money. We weren't going to make maybe any money. Mm -hmm. But we were going to keep the shop busy for six months. Mm -hmm. That was my talk, my entire focus. Mm -hmm. I have work. <laughs> I have something to do. And it's creative. And that's all I ask of, yeah. of my career, really. Mm -hmm. It's just keep me in the studio and keep me working. Mm -hmm. and years of training make it work because mm -hmm. you learn how to plan from the beginning. Mm -hmm. It all starts with the ability to draw. Mm -hmm. You draw it, you make it right, you size it, and if you get it right on paper, then it's just a process of making it piece by piece by piece, keeping your nose right to it, and mm -hmm. go through the process. That's all there is to it. Yeah. You can't think about, oh my God, what am I into? You mm -hmm. just Okay, one more window, get it down there, rivet it, screw it on. Now I don't have to do that one again. We'll go to the next one. <laughs> uh, yep. It's, um, I think everybody goes through that. It, it, mm -hmm. I don't care what your skill mm -hmm. level is or what it is you're making. Mm -hmm. It's all about process. Yeah. And to me, that's where the, the balance between art and craft mm -hmm. lies. The craft is in the construction, the fabrication. Mm -hmm. The art is in the design, the planning. Mm -hmm and bringing the two together at the right point yeah and that's what it's all about i mean that's the business of art right um, it's a lot different than going into the studio and saying i'm going to paint today mm -hmm. you know, whatever comes to my mind i'm going to make it right i'm going to hang it on the gallery wall and if they like it good and if they don't so what right it's a whole different process mm -hmm. than going through trying to design something that's going to appeal to a community. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a purpose for this. Right. And it's partly bringing my skills to the, the needs of the project. Mm -hmm. And it's a whole... Right. And expressing an artistic desire in the community that maybe they can't even articulate, but they just know that they want something... They want something and that expresses who would something ever have thought of putting their buildings on train cars. Right. To me, that's the, the relationship between my art mm -hmm. and the public art project. Mm -hmm. Because having a background in cartooning, mm -hmm. this is a cartoon. Mm -hmm. And the essence of the, you know, of the concept makes it a cartoon, even though right. it's very graphically defined mm -hmm. I mean it's 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 structured right it's architectural it's very uh, much designed with line and form and mm -hmm. you know but it's all been again just brought through because of everything I've ever learned to do mm -hmm. and I think most people work that way yeah, of course. Your yeah. your experience is always going to influence your take on you things. You grow with your work. Yeah. I mean, everything I've ever done is predicated on the project I did before. Mm -hmm. yep. I wouldn't have been in a position to get that job at Advanced Animations as a creative director if I hadn't just come off of restoring an amusement park in mm -hmm. Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. which came about because I had worked at a, at a 
van painting company, <laughs> you know, <laughs> painting murals. And right. Because I, before that I had made signs and before that I had been a package designer. And each one mm -hmm. got me the next step mm -hmm. in, I think that's what a career building is all about. Right. You know, you go, well, I'm going to learn to do this. Mm -hmm. I, or you do this kind of thing, can you do it on a different surface in a different medium? Exactly. You go, oh, uh, I don't know, let's try that. What's the difference? Make it in aluminum, make it in glass, make it in wood, put it on paper. Uh huh. Yeah. It's all the same. Mm -hmm. It's just, I mean, they, one of the things we always used to say in school is technique is cheap. Mm. You know, you got to have an idea first. Mm -hmm. And then how you make it is, right. anybody can learn to make it. Right. But, yeah. Very cool. So um, I want to back up a little bit and talk for a minute about your, um, your glass work, because uh, that's more what you're probably known for. Um, how, so you, you took this class in Oregon mm -hmm. and then how did that come about? You said at first you were just making maybe one or two pieces a year. Did you start to get commissions or was it right into more of the restoration work? Um, basically went right. I mean, I made a few pieces for people when mm -hmm. I really started when I moved to Randolph, mm -hmm. um, in 76. Mm -hmm. And, uh, like I said, working for these, um, antique dealers mm -hmm. and then I jumped I mean I was doing a, a few pieces on my own for cabinet doors for cabinet makers and gifts and kind of teaching myself mm -hmm. right? after that initial one-week class I never took another class mm -hmm. it was actually a matter of applying my design background to the classwork Right, I imagine um, that the class really gave you that foundation. Right. And then technique. I got into the salvage business mm -hmm. and I started restoring mm -hmm. literally hundreds of windows. Mm -hmm. I just installed a window in Roanoke, Virginia two years ago. It was 40 feet long. Entirely painted, no, no color in it. It's all black and white. Mm -hmm. It's all black paint on clear glass mm -hmm. of trains going in. To, for it was a trained photographer photography museum mm -hmm. in Roanoke mm -hmm. and again it was a, a commission that I accepted um, having no idea what I was getting into <laughs> no concept of how much work it was going to take it ended up taking me two years to complete the job Wow um, but it was a wonderful opportunity mm -hmm. you know it was like taking a college education in glass painting. Right. Um, you know, the piece that's in the kiln right now, it took me two and a half hours to do, mm -hmm. and put it in the kiln and fire it, done. Mm -hmm. Five years ago, it would take me a week. <laughs> so, you know, right. um, I still will go after some of these larger projects, mm -hmm. but um, I'm slowing down a little bit. Mm -hmm. There are times, and there have been times, very often these days, I will design a house and then help build it. Mm -hmm. For two reasons. I enjoy it. Mm -hmm. And to me, again, it's an opportunity to interact with people, not only with the homeowner, mm -hmm. but with a group of people that are doing something they love, which is building. Mm -hmm. And um, to me, that is a craft, and a craft is a craft. Mm -hmm. I don't care whether you're throwing clay or... or Weaving on a loom, mm -hmm. you know, or whittling a neckerchief slide. It's right. a craft. Yeah. And there's an art to it. Mm -hmm. And um, and I appreciate it all. So. Right. And you can step back from your work and say a job well done, whether it's a house or a you can. art installation or and a all single, the work in here, window. remodeling this place and mm -hmm. the apartment next door, I did myself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, there's a benefit mm -hmm. to having skills, whatever they are. Yeah. That's great. It's all tied together. Well, I think that's a good note to end on. I it is all it is. Tied, tied together. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Phil, for chatting with me today. Well, you're and welcome. Yeah, it's good to get to know you a little better and, and really impressed by your work. Fantastic stuff. 
Um, we will give you Phil's contact information in case you are in the market for any kind of custom work. Um, any and, kind of custom work. <laughs> <laughs> maybe you need a floor plan for your house. I don't know. Um, but thank you guys for joining us and tune in next time for more Vermont Arts and Crafts. Cheers. <laughs>